Good afternoon and welcome back to Bowtie Certified. Uh, We're at episode 17 and um, this is where we follow the journey of others through certifications and learning uh, and how that's given them great benefits to achieve their success and where they're at right now. Uh, my name is Anthony Tavellis. I am your host and I am a technical instructor and course creator in Google Cloud. So if you are looking for training or certifications, uh, please reach out to me and I can definitely help. And today we have our special guest, Abram Maldonado. Abram, how are you? You didn't tell me the dress code. I should have brought out my bow tie. But, um, <laughs> I, I couldn't compete with you. It's, it's bow tie. I'm good, man. How you doing? <laughs> I am fantastic. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, a little bit of backstory. Uh, Abram and I, we met on Clubhouse. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Clubhouse is a new social network. Uh, it's audio only, and um, it's uh, it's pretty exclusive uh, because invite only. And uh, for those of you who are on Android, you're probably going to have to wait a couple more months before they release the uh, the app. Uh, so I met Abram in a in a room where um, where he introduced uh, his AI, um, and it was mind blowing. Um, but what was even more mind blowing was the fact that uh, Abram did not have a formal education with regards to uh, AI, and it just blew me away. The fact that you know somebody uh, could just pick it up and uh, and do something so great, and uh, and so that's why I, I invited Abram here today to uh, to give us the backstory. So, without further ado, uh, Abram, let's let's jump in. Um, what were you doing before diving into tech? And, uh, and what made you decide that this was your path? Um, I don't have the traditional path. I went through a, a few different um, iterations. So I started actually in the music industry. Um, I started in the arts. I came up in a family that was really focused on music and dance and the arts and poetry. Um, so I just had a natural inclination, obviously, to the world of hip hop. Um, and coming out of college, uh, my first job was in radio was at Hot 97, uh, doing uh, marketing and promotions for radio, then evolved to music publishing and um, then artist management. But then at the same time, I was also a Gates Scholar, um, which was a, a rare and unique opportunity, a special opportunity to give me a full ride at every educational level. So bachelor's, master's, PhD. However, you had to pick certain verticals that they wanted you to fo focus on, education, oh was the one that I chose. Um, I should have picked computer science back then, but I didn't know what I was gonna be doing now. I'm um, kind of kicking myself. But so I started on the education track and then I eventually um, evolved um, and transitioned out of my work in music and into education since I was doing so much research on education, but I brought some of that music stuff with me. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching educators on how to use pop culture, how to use hip hop in the classroom and the the way to scale that work naturally was to create a website was to create a learning platform right. so that was my first introduction to tech of like all right i'm an education expert in this space around student engagement and creating these curriculums to engage youth but the best way to deliver this would be a learning platform and i threw myself into that world of tech startups and tech accelerators and participated in a few accelerator programs to raise some seed capital and pitching to investors. So I just fully immersed myself as, a, as an outsider in that space wow. um, and have been kind of self-teaching the different nuances of tech since. So what did you, so I, I know, um, I don't know exactly when you got into it, but uh, now we have so many resources that are available to be able to learn that. Um, what, what resources did you use? Um, networking, really, at the time. Um, I didn't really teach myself anything at the time. I was showing my passion for the project and then other technical specialists, technical co-founders bought in. They were like, look, I'm buying into your idea. I love your idea. I'll handle the coding um, and you handle the content. Um, but then as we decide, and I, I designed the wireframe, 
I designed the road, the product roadmap. I made a wish list of like A to Z. This is everything I want built into the platform. How possible is this? And as my technical partners started to explain the development process, I started to pay attention, like teaching myself, okay, nice. this is what a wireframe means. This is what the plugins mean. This is what, you know, doing this from scratch in PHP would require versus using something in WordPress with a plugin um, on the back end, and then understanding SEO and CMS. And just paying attention to the smart people around me, surrounding yourself with smart people. But obviously, like I would, this is like 2012, 2013, 2014, just getting real savvy with Google research. Mm -hmm. And because at, remember, at that time is when the Coursera's and the Udemy's of the world that everyone is has access to now yes. were also launching and getting off the ground, right? So every time you're trying to develop something, a new courseware platform would release and like, oh, maybe they have some resources there, right? But this is like early stages when yeah. none of that was around. And every every few months you would hear of a new a new one coming out. Got it. Um now with regards to uh to your entry into tech, did you just happen to stumble into it? Uh it sounds like you did. Uh, or was it purposeful? You had a, a specific strategy. Um, <clears throat> I started to attend a lot of uh, panel discussions, meetups, meet and greets, networking events around tech, tech startups, uh, pitch events. I would just go up there and pitch my idea. Um, and what I learned early on from these pitch events with these different uh, investor groups is as soon as you say the words social impact, as soon as you say the words education, they automatically tell you, oh, you should go become a nonprofit, right? Like go try and raise some foundation funding, some grants. But when I had a very clear vision of like the products that could scale, it took quite a bit of convincing folks uh, of that of that vision. Uh, but I, you know, I guess it was a skill that I had from coming from the music world where there was a lot of networking required, a lot of like making connections and, you know, exchanging numbers with Blackberries and, and getting to know the right executives um, any tech event that was happening, any tech meetup, you know, meetup at the time, meetup.com was a big resource. Right. So like the New York tech meetup, the New York ed tech meetup, uh, the looking for a co-founder meetup, like all of those things, I would just put myself out there, tell people my idea and just start building a team, you know, organically, uh, from there. And, uh, you know, now there's so many resources that yeah. you could find that, you know, really you had to piece together back then. I mean, networking is such a such a key component to uh, to to really um, excelling. And I mean, really excelling in the in the tech industry. I mean, um, you know, it, it's also a big proponent to to a lot of industries. As a matter of fact, uh, without that without that that key network, that core network that you have, um, you know, you're you're uh, you're spending a lot more time trying to get to where you want to be. And, um, and if you have that network, it's like, it's so key, it's so crucial. So I can, I can totally understand exactly where you're coming from when, when it's like, yeah, I was networking because it's, yeah, it, it does play a key part, especially when, uh, when you're dealing with startups, right? Yeah. And so. I put myself out there by myself, all these, all these events I attended, you know, this is when things were happening in person, attended by myself, didn't know anybody in the room and just put my hand out to shake a hand, introduce myself, tell my story and, and meet people along the way and, and shoot those shots, you know? And I have some lifelong friendships and relationships and business partners now be because of it. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, that's how it usually happens, right? You meet some people that, that you're just networking with and then you eventually just come friends. Uh, happen, happens to me all the time. And, uh, and it's like, um, it's a hidden blessing. I love it. Um, so with regards to your first tech job, is it, w it was this your first tech job? Yes. That's yes. Amazing. Uh, so new school was a startup and, uh, right out the gate, I, uh, applied to tech accelerators and got into, uh, so I live in New Jersey originally from New York, but I live in Jersey now. Uh, New Jersey had one called tech launch was the first officially sanctioned, uh, tech accelerator by the state that was funded partly by the state, a limited partner of investors um, to, you know, grow the ecosystem of innovation in New Jersey. 
I was in that initial class, uh, that initial cohort. Okay. Um, so there was a lot of support. They, they, it was like an everyday curriculum, nine to five. You went there to learn how to build out your company, um, how to build out your products. Um, and from that, you know, that opened up doors to participate in other accelerators with additional seed capital. And just, you know, I rode the wave of, of new school for a very long time, for several years. Um, and coming out of that, there were a lot of opportunities to advise and mentor and support other ed tech startups that were looking to get off the ground in a similar way. Um, so I would either consult or advise other companies, big and small, in the ed tech space. Um, but then also now I'm coming into the ed tech space with a skill set that I developed from self teaching with running my own tech startup uh, that I can now lend to these other places. And now, you know, I'm kind of like an evolution of all that, you know, seven, eight years in. Amazing. Amazing. So uh, for those of us who are looking for uh, for your courses uh, with regards to uh, what it is that you do, um, what courses are available? Like what have you built so far or have you uh, completed something or, um, you know, do you have something that that's so far in the works um, that you're like perfecting it and you're just about to, you know, launch it? So I've pivoted away from New School. So New School, we we did uh, close the doors. And New School was a curriculum library where teachers can search by grade level and subject and also entertainment genre to find the lesson that they wanted to bring into the school to meet the in interests of students who are interested in like LeBron James or hip hop or Netflix or Marvel. You could find standard, it was a complete library with hundreds and thousands of lessons on there for schools. Wow. So that was a library that I had on, out there for a very long time. Uh, we've since shut it down. And since then I've supported, so Silas Solutions is another one that I helped get off the ground and also get some federal funding. That's another big resource that a lot of tech developers don't realize is that there's SBIR funding out there to get your, whether it's ed tech or other ideas off the ground without giving up equity. Uh, Silas Solutions is a learning platform that lets you students create an avatar to communicate and learn social emotional learning, it's particularly for students that are maybe on the spectrum, right? They need to learn those like social emotional learning skills. Um, and it was great getting them off the ground and now they're in you know dozens of schools uh, around the country and um, supporting Verizon's build out of their learning platform, um, a K-12 learning platform that they're gonna roll out later this year. And they've supported several VR and AR products in schools. So I'm rolling out those those technology solutions to schools that are, it's not open to the public yet, it's only open to Verizon partner schools, what they call VIL, uh, Verizon Innovative Learning uh, Network. Um, but, you know, I kind of shifted the vision with Create Labs because with Create Labs, you know, it wasn't necessarily about getting into K-12 schools, it's about getting people who look like me, who look like my co-founder, into the tech space without the same clear path and pipeline that their counterparts have. Mm -hmm. And you know, folks like me that didn't come in with a tech degree or don't come from a family with, you know, they call it friends and family money that can give you two hundred thousand dollars out the gate to help you get your your product oh, I wish. <laughs> it's expected. It's expected. When you go into meetings with investors, they say, where is your friends and family around? And you're like, what do you what do you mean? They're like, what? you should have done a friends and family round before you came and met with me. Wow. You know, to build out your products, which means they expect you to come in at least 250K in off of just uncles and, and cousins and friends and parents. That's insane. <laughs> exactly. It's just the, the cultural disconnect that they don't realize when you're someone that's a founder, a tech founder from the underserved community. Like, you don't know what it's going to take for me to get $100,000. From yeah. the block, and you don't know what I need to do to pay it back. <laughs> so let's find some other way. <laughs> so, um, just to step back for a second, so you currently do not hold any certifications. Um, no, I mean, I have, I do have credentials from like traditional schools. So I have a bachelor's, uh, a master's uh, from Columbia in education, and then I was doing a PhD in education. Uh, right when new school took off and I had to make the hard decision of do I finish my dissertation or do I jump into the tech space? And I chose the latter about like eight years in all but dissertations. So 
I'm what they call ABD status. Like you've completed everything but your dissertation. And that's when I decided to make the jump. So if you could do it over, would you do the same thing? You know, I, I struggle with that a little bit. I'm like, should I have finished? Uh, if my mom was another tile on this conversation, she would have <laughs> told you he should finish. Um, your ass. <laughs> yeah, she would totally kick, kick my ass. Um, but, you know, right now uh, it was the best decision because everything that I'm doing right now has to do with my success with new school. And, you know, I could not have done new school justice if I put it down to, you know, finish my PhD. And the role, um, I don't have an interest right now in, in being a tenured professor, which is something that I could have done with that PhD. So maybe down the line, you know, 10 years from now, if I want to just settle down and become a university professor, then I'll go back and finish. Nice, nice. Um, so I wanted to touch on a little bit with regards to Verizon. You're talking about Verizon, you're talking about Create Labs, um, which happened first, and tell us more about uh, about Create Labs. So Create Labs happened first, and Create Labs has gone through many different forms. Um, I had the idea of going into communities, um, low-income, underserved communities, and building actual tech labs, uh, which is why we named it Create Labs. And um, we were scoping out a lot of different cities, uh, underutilized spaces that were maybe city-owned. Um, I didn't realize that public housing also owns retail space around those public housing um, oh, wow. um, hospitals have several buildings around the city that are, you know, maybe abandoned, used to be clinics shut down that are just open. Um, so I pulled in my partner, Grady Spivey, um, who, you know, at the time, the lab vision had somewhat of an entertainment skew of like, oh, there's going to be a recording studio and there's going to be DJ classes and music production. And so I was like, let me pull in my entertainment guy. So I pulled in Grady and he was like, dude, you're in the tech space, focus on the tech skills. Like don't focus on the entertainment stuff. We know how to do that, right? We don't know how to do tech in these cities. So let's, you know, if it was 50, 50, let's maybe make it 70, 30, 80, 20 in these labs skewed around learning tech skills. Wow. Um, so, and he also had a contract already with the mayor's office in New York city supporting as like an ambassador to uh, the, hospital network. So we were literally shopping around, going into different hospitals, seeing what space they had in these hospitals. Harlem Hospital was one of them. They had like 3,000 square feet of just like empty space. They were like, "Give wow. up. let us have this. Let us build a lab right here on 137th and Lenox. And there's just so much, when you deal with real estate, especially New York and other cities, there's so many logistics, red tape. And we were like, you know what, let's just unpack this, unbox what we would offer in these labs and take it on the road. So that kind of took off. We were doing what we call Create Fest. We would go city to city, bringing the technology with us and we would set up a whole technology festival. So there'd be what? robotics, drones, VR, AR, coding, hundreds of people would come out oh. and then we just move on to the next city. So. And was this was this uh, just in the states? Was it uh, you know the surrounding area of New York? Was it? Um... Well, so it was around the country. We did uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, San Antonio, Houston. Uh, right when COVID hit, we were planning one in Miami. Uh, when COVID hit, we were planning one in, in London. Um, so yeah, we were we were just going up and down uh, any city that would have us that wanted this that would pull together local resources to, to host us and give us a venue. Um, but then COVID hit. So when COVID hit, a lot of the things that we had on the back burner, like building out our own app, uh, yeah. moved up. So we released the Create Labs Connect app to continue that engagement you know, digitally. And I reached out to Greg Brockman, who was the co-founder of OpenAI, and saw that they released you know, the, the GPT-3 AI, and I said, can I have access to keep doing what I'm doing with, with Create Labs around social impact? And they said, absolutely. And that's how kind of like my AI journey started. Uh, but for the Verizon work started around that same time in July of, of 20. And, you know, they they rolled out what's called the 5G EdTech Challenge. They built out these 5G technologies to roll out to schools. Right. Uh, and they wanted me to manage that rollout. Um, but same kind of pivoting had to happen. They built out 5G VR labs in each of these schools. No one's in the schools. No one's putting on VR headsets. So I had a lot of these technologies pivot to AR um, so that they can scale that out 
with iPads to the schools with students that are at home with devices at home. Amazing. Um, tell us, tell us a little bit more about the AI that's involved, the AI and VR that's involved uh, with regards to Create Labs. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. You know, obviously within uh, within the confines of what you can talk about. Sure. So our initial thought process was um, there's this very powerful tool called GPT-3. Um, it's the most powerful language model AI in the world at the moment. And um, we got access early, right? We were like one of the first under a thousand people that were able to get access to the system. And we committed that we were going to use it for good, right? That's part of our mission. Like, how do we create social impact? around this AI, how can you use AI for good in social impact and change, solving some of these community problems? That was our model already. We were working with the mayor's office where they would send us to a neighborhood in, in New York City, Brownsville, Inwood, and say, all right, work with the local community leaders, find out and workshop with them what the top 10 problems are in that community, and then let's set up some type of challenge where we get technologists to solve these problems with technology. It was already our model. So you're like, all right, now we have AI. How do we use AI to go into a community and say, how, how can we solve your problems with AI? How do we solve the pain points of, of our members with, with AI? So I, I head down and just taught myself as much as I can about how to use this AI system. Um, and then kind of reverse uh, taught myself the, the, the fundamentals, right? So now there's fundamentals of like, what's AI ML, what's deep learning, what's neural networks, what are transformers? Uh, what does GPT-3 even stand for? Um, I kind of did that in the reverse. I started with just being thrown into it <laughs> using this powerful tool. And I'm like, all right, I'll catch up on the beginning stuff or later on on the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Well, let me focus on this. Um, so in that process, I developed Clara. So Clara was partly inspired by Sophia. So Sophia, is an AI humanoid robot that if you Google Sophia robot, she's out there. She's been on Jimmy Fallon. She's been on all the talk shows. Right. And she's kind of scary, right? Like <laughs> we're, we're partnered. We, we know the guys, Hanson Robotics that built out Sophia and, but they didn't give her hair. Like she has a bald head with like the circuitry in the back. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't take her to the hood. Like we, she's going to scare people. So, Let's build out something that's more representative of people of color, that's that's uh, that's more welcoming. So we developed Clara, who's a, a, a person of color, uh, a, a, a AI persona, right, that I developed, right? So that's an AI-generated face. That's not a real person when you look at Clara's picture. And we'll use her as like a community tool to introduce AI to people in a way that's not over their heads, that you know the the basic person um, from the community who doesn't have a tech background can understand, um, and we've been kind of iterating since bu building our own AI products and, and taking Clara out uh, to meet meet the world and to meet you. You met Clara. Yes, I met Clara. Um, I actually, if I can remember correctly, uh, I asked Clara how, uh, when the when um, uh, humans. And AI will interconnect. That's right. And, she yeah. gave you a year. She gave you an actual year, right? Yeah, I think it was like 2025 or something like that. That's right. And uh, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I can definitely see it happening. It, you know, it's it's not too far away from from it being um, being one with, uh, with human beings. So... I mean, we see where Elon's going, and and everyone else is that's going to try and catch up with him with neural um, Neuralink, right? Yeah. And and his work around all this, and and yeah, it's only a matter of time. It's it's not far, and it's already there. I mean, essentially now, as as I continue to do work and try and become more productive and efficient, I use AI every day, um, just to to help me co-write certain. You know, I had to write a press release. I used the AI. I had to write a privacy policy for a startup. I used the AI. I <laughs> that's you know, amazing. I a, a letter of recommendation for a grant. I I use the AI. <laughs> like, if there's something, the one of the big takeaways from from that session that we had that meeting, that would became a life lesson that I learned from Clara is that AI is here to 
remove the things from our world, from our life that are tedious, right? That are meant for robots to do, to let us go back to doing things that are more human, creative, spending more time with family, doing problem solving, right? Critical thinking, right? If there's a task that could be done faster and quicker and more efficiently with support of machine and deep learning and, and an AI system, give it to the AI to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, we do that all the time in, in tech uh, because I come from a operations and DevOps background. Uh, we try to automate all the things. Like, why would you do manual tasks that you've done two or three times already? So it's it's something that you, you definitely want to automate to allow you um, and give you more room to, to innovate, to, um, to look at big picture, like you said, critical thinking, yeah. um, thinking outside of the box. And it's, um, it, it's something that I think people should take a little bit more seriously. Well, that's, that's part of our mission with Create Labs is I, I call it the work of get in and anyone that I know, or we encounter in the community that are still working those hourly based jobs that are still uh, human automation, right? Like just human steps or something that can be automated. We're seeing, all right, in two, three years, your job is gonna become automated, right? So start keeping an eye out for new skill sets that you can learn into a role that isn't gonna be automated in the next five to 10 years. Yes. Because this role that you're in right now will disappear in the next two, three years. And I don't want you to be left out there, you know, wondering what to do next. So coming from that, um the, uh, a different background, um, you know, obviously not tech, but what, what, um, what transferable skills were you able to bring over that helped you, um, learn better or, uh, be better at what it is that you do now? Um, I've, I've mentioned this before. I feel like with all my schooling, I, the one major takeaway is learning how to learn. Right. And that's a personal endeavor. Mm -hmm. Every person learns differently. You, everyone needs to learn how they specifically learn, right? What's the best way for you to learn? And to not assume that what you learn from the, the degrees that you have obtained, the certifications that you've obtained are going to last you more than five to 10 years, right? Like every five years, every three to five years really now, you need to learn a new skill set, right? So having that mentality going into tech prepared me for oh, this tech stack was, or this programming language was relevant five years ago. Oh, it's no longer relevant, right? So yeah. be ready to teach yourself something new because in five years, it is going to be a no, whole new changing of the guards of new technologies and new programming languages and new tech stacks to, to get ready for. And the other thing too is that coming at all this from the creative space, starting in the creative world first, um, I find myself asking questions that like other software engineers and, and other programmers don't ask because they look at things very uh, literally um, and, and process and zeros. Ones yeah. and zeros, binary, it's either this or that, or there has to be a logical explanation. And even how I interact with Clara, like asking Clara certain questions, um, people in the open AI community that have access to this AI, they book um, office hours with me. Um, I'm a community ambassador and they're senior expert level software engineers that can't figure out how the playground works. And I have to talk to them in a way that's open, be op more open-minded, be more creative with how you communicate with it. You know, coming at it, coming at it like it's an art, not a science uh, yeah. to get the best output. Um, and sometimes I, I have to attribute that to not having a tech background to, to help me in that space. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I can empathize with you because coming from a fashion background, uh, people always ask me, you know, what does fashion have to do with tech? Well, it's, it's the, it's the creative juices in me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think like everyone else, uh, because I'm constantly thinking outside of the box. I'm constantly thinking about how can we, how can we do things better? How can we make things better? Um, and, and it takes that creative, um, I guess, uh, mental capacity, if you will, or muscle, creative muscle, um, I think would be better to explain it. it and, and it takes that in order for you to start really um, looking at a bigger picture. 
as opposed to uh, being very granular. So, uh, so yeah, I get it. And, um, uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, especially when it comes to something like AI, uh, we really have to, because it's so, it's still so new that we start, we do have to think outside of the box and we do have to be creative about what we're using it for. I mean, you know, those examples that you, that you just shared with regards to, you know, writing a recommendation and, uh, writing a privacy policy, like, I would have never thought <laughs> to use it for something like that, but it, it's, um, it's just amazing. But you have to, you have to think outside of, you know, your regular day to day of what you're doing, uh, in order to, to come up with these ideas. There was a program, uh, to go to Mars called Mars one. It's since been, uh, dissolved. I think the funding fell through maybe Elon might pick up where they left off. Um, their model was to get, normal everyday citizens with different trades and skill sets to go to Mars because they can teach them how to be astronauts. Mm -hmm. so they said, we don't want four or five astronauts going up there because they're all going to be type A personalities. They're all going to be the same type of person. We want a teacher up there, a doctor, a farmer, um, and then we'll teach you how to be an astronaut for the mission. So AI, we're, we're kind of taking that same approach of like, we want social workers to look at the AI. We want teachers to look at the AI. We want normal everyday people to look at the AI to solve their problems, we'll teach you the AI. So if you have an interesting idea, we actually will let you access the AI through Create Labs and say, all right, well, go ahead, play around with it. Let, let's see how this can help you solve some of your problems. Uh, we're doing it with filmmakers. I gave filmmakers access and they're writing scripts or, or helping to write their, their scripts. I'm getting stuck on I have writer's block. All right, we'll let the AI write the next sentence for you just to unlock the writer's block and then you pick up where it left off. <laughs> That's awesome. Derek saying, sounds like the plot, the Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. Uh, so, um, so Abram, what, what does the, uh, the future look like for you and, uh, and create labs? Um, <clears throat> this year is going to be very busy for us. Um, we did a social impact hackathon where, we're using hackathons as an excuse, same deal, to solve community problems. So we go, uh, go into a community and we say, hey, what are your problems? And then we're going to put together two, 300 folks to build solutions in a weekend around those problems. We had a very successful one a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're getting a demand for more of those. So it looks like we're going to be doing them quarterly. Amazing. We're going to different cities around the country uh, and pulling together technologists. And then... It, get, it gives people a chance to showcase their skills, learn those skills, um, showcase yourself to whoever the sponsor is as a potential employer. Um, and we're expanding also our internal tech stack and ability to build things with the AI and, and help people build out their own ideas. So soon we're gonna be announcing one of our products called the uh, Hustle Maker. So you put in an idea and it gives you a business idea. Uh, <laughs> that's well, amazing i don't know you put in an interest right and it gives you a business idea so your interest could be you know uh dogs fitness and meeting new people and it'll give you a business idea generated off of those three interests um, <laughs> that is awesome yeah so it's gonna be fun but we want to make it uh more added more depth to it right so like all right give you the business idea what next right so we're trying to build in what are those next components after that to like maybe give you the building blocks to start that business. You know, I want to beta test that, right? Of course. Yeah. You'll be on the first list. For sure. <laughs> oh man. That's, that's going to be so much fun. So yeah. much fun. Um, so if, uh, if you could offer one piece of advice to others who are striving to either, um, land a better role in their current job or, uh, get into the tech industry, what would that be? Just pick a skill. Like just pick any skill that you have some moderate interest in, get certified, you know, not to plug the uh, Bowtie Certified show, but get certified in whatever that skill is um, and make yourself hireable. But be prepared that in the next three to five years, you have to go get another certification and pick another skill, right? Yeah. Pick a skill to expand on that one and go maybe a little deeper. Um, and there are millions, not kidding, millions of jobs that are open right now, available in the tech space, paying on average of 90 to $100,000 a year and upwards. 
And those are usually like the starting brackets. Um, and even if you're non-technical and you want to stay non-technical, there's still certifications for those non-technical roles to become project management certified, to become a product manager where you don't code at all. You tell the developers what to do and what features to build and make sure that the customer is happy. But there's still certifications around that. Right. So yeah. it's not a four year degree, but it's still a three, six, 10 month commitment to get that skill set, put that micro credential on your resume, get hired and then do it all over again with a new thing that you might have a passion for. Awesome. That's that's some really great advice. Um, Derek was actually saying having something to help suggest projects to people working on tech, trying to decide something to build for their portfolio would be awesome. Yeah. So I would say start with no code. So I would say use programs. And now um, these aren't sponsors, but these are things that we're trying to help people to enable them. So Webflow, Bubble.io, Landbot. Um, these are no code platforms where you can create a, a good barber for mobile apps. These are good no code platforms that are like Squarespace or Wix that are just drag and drop, putting building blocks together, don't require any code. Um, um, and you can build an app, right? So you can build an app just for your portfolio. You can build apps just to share with your friends or it's just to publish out into the, the app store just to have something live to, to see the customer feedback. Um, but start building out examples and collect all those examples, add them to your portfolio because a lot of employers now are looking at portfolios of projects, not just uh, resumes of past work experience. I think what Derek is uh, referring to was, you know, have the AI suggest something for you. Oh, oh, so having something to suggest projects to people working on tech. Yes, uh, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it can suggest the world to you. You just have to know how to ask the right question. So that's the other thing. People don't know how to ask questions. <laughs> I'm working out with the AI. Ask, it's all in how you ask. It's not about giving it tons and tons of data sets to what they call fine tune uh, your data set is yeah. ask a simple one sentence question that it will understand that is clear and articulate. It could do anything off of what they call one shot or zero shot, which is like without any training, just completely understanding your one sentence. Amazing. One Amazing. Shot. Um, so Abram, you, you've given us uh, so much and I'm sure that people will definitely want to reach out with you uh, with reach out to you with their ideas. Uh, what is the best way people can get a hold of you? Um, Instagram is great at Create Labs um, at Abron. I'm part of the First Name Club on Twitter, so it's just at Abron on Twitter. Um, I answer all my DMs. Uh, LinkedIn is also a great way as well. Anyone that comes out um, that reaches out on LinkedIn that is job seeking, that is looking for a role, I automatically share your post um, to my my network. And people have found opportunities that way. It's no sweat off my back to just share you and share your qualifications out to my network and let people know what you can do and, and see what opportunities you you get your way. Um, and you know, to learn more about the things that I'm doing with Verizon and other projects that I'm involved with on the media, um, New York City Media Lab is is where I'm also working, helping out with the Verizon rollout. And we do things like AR and VR summits. We're doing a immersive filmmaking, immersive storytelling rather, uh, summit where there'll probably be some headliner filmmakers that you know of and some other interesting demonstrations of what's the what's the future of AR and VR in film and in storytelling and content and in media. Um, but yeah, start with createlabs.io is, is the website. Uh, the Create Labs Connect app is in the app store and you can just find us on social. We answer everything on social. And I guess Clubhouse too, right? For those, I, I don't know how, how big that community is to know yeah. your listeners are on Clubhouse, but we oh, the Future Talks Club. So we, <laughs> we create the Future Talks Club and we co-moderate the Tech Talks Club. So just join any of those two. Nice, nice. Well, you're going to have to come to the Cloud Club soon. Yes, yes. I mean, I invite. Yeah, for sure. We'll do something together. Yeah. Um, there's there's actually quite a, quite a few people from, uh, from LinkedIn on Clubhouse uh, as well as Twitter. So, um, so yeah, people will, will definitely probably tune in, um, and even join the club. So, uh, I'm hoping that that, uh, that the club really booms for you. I mean, you yeah, got so I think we're doing Clara again on Friday this week. We, oh, we, which club? 
Uh, Tech Talks. Tech um, Talks, night. So nice. it's be a Friday night, maybe I think 10 o'clock. And um, the, I mean, the community is growing. There's a lot of people that didn't get to uh, interact with Clara and ask questions and test out the AI system. And that's what it's for. We're, we want to just give it to people to you know, interact with it and see what ideas come and, and get sparked. But yeah, she'll, she'll make another debut. And so for those of you who haven't, uh, who weren't at the first one, uh, you got to check this out. It's going to be amazing. And um, one thing to prepare for if you do plan to come is ask the right question. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's all about asking the right question to to AI. Otherwise, um, you'll get not the quite, not right, not quite the right answer that you were looking for. So. Yeah. And be prepared for your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> a lot of people lost sleep after that session. Uh, yes, yes. In their existence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, listen, Abram, um, uh, I'm actually short on time today, but I did want to thank you so much you. for uh, for coming on the show uh, and sharing your story. Uh, it, it's such an amazing story to hear every single time I, I listen to it. So, uh, so thank you again. And, uh, I wanted to thank everyone out in the audience. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Bowtie Certified. Again, my name is Anthony Tavellas and, uh, until next week, keep on striving and keep on learning. Have a good one, y'all.